today on CityCast Philly. Why two Democratic state lawmakers resigned this week. And we've got the details on the potential chemical contamination at Bartram's Garden. Plus, more details on a TikTok controversy at a nearby middle school. It's Friday, July 19th. I'm Trina Nuri, and here's what Philly's talking about. This week, I know you've all felt the extreme heat. Uh, there was also another weather event that happened. Maddie Hanna, education reporter, Jillian McGoldrick, state government reporter, and Frank Coomer, environmental reporter. All of y'all are at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Can you guess what this weather event was? So this is like a quiz to start off <laughs> this Friday news <laughs> roundup. I'll give you a multiple choice options. Was it A, an earthquake, B, a tornado, C, snow, or D, a hurricane? What happened in our region this week? Anybody know? I do happen to know that. Frank, I knew you would know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you know. What was it, Frank? Uh, there was a uh, a reading at the Philadelphia airport of, a, of hail during a storm. And uh, because it's frozen precipitation, it gets recorded as snow. So we set a record for that day uh, of trace amount of snow. Snow in July. Can you believe it? <laughs> I wish there was more to cool us down. <laughs> Um, so yes, yeah, so obviously it wasn't enough for a snowball fight, but it really was some wacky weather. Um, have you ever seen snow before in the summer, Frank? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll, put it, I'll put it very short. No, I have not. Jillian, Maddie, have y'all ever seen like weird, wacky weather in July? No, I had no idea that happened, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Especially not like on a hundred degree day. I right. could never expect snow. <laughs> right, right. How did you guys uh, stay cool this week? We actually lost power uh, one night and uh, we were out all night. It was the hottest day of the year. It was mm -hmm. hit 98 degrees that day. And overnight it was it was like a swamp in our house all night long. So sorry to hear that. The tree, tree fell. Yep. Maddie, how are you staying cool? Um, I'm not sure I succeeded, really. I'm, I'm in the city. Um, I did uh, definitely take the opportunity to eat ice cream. Good. Where'd you get ice cream from? <laughs> Just my freezer. Okay. okay. Nothing, <laughs> nothing uh, special. <laughs> uh, Jillian, what about you? How are you staying cool? I stayed sitting directly in front of my air conditioner unit. <laughs> like literally right in front of it. All right, let's talk about the shakeup that happened in Harrisburg, Jillian. Two Democratic State House representatives announced that they were resigning from office. Donna Bullock, who represented North Philly since 2015, and Stephen Kinsey, who represented Northwest Philly since 2013. And that's according to some of your reporting I read in the Inquirer, Jillian. So from what I understand, these resignations weren't too surprising, right? Yeah, we had known that Representative Donna Bullock would be resigning likely sometime this year after she had taken um, the big position as CEO at Project Home, which is an anti-homelessness uh, nonprofit that is pretty nationally well known for its work. Um, it just didn't seem like she'd be able to keep doing both just because of how demanding that new job would be. Mm -hmm. um, and then Representative Kinsey, he had already said he wasn't going to run again, um, but he had seemed like he would try and stay in office through the rest of the year. Um, a very weird Harrisburg thing is that this session ends at the end of November, so then for the, a whole month until the start of January, there just is no government <laughs> um, the, until they swear in everybody again in January. Mm -hmm. But so we had thought that both of them may try and stay till the end of November. But Jillian, was, was there some like strategy involved with these decisions to resign this week? Yeah, they 
have decided to resign over as soon as the state budget was complete. So they had their Democratic majority. Oh, I see. And then they decided to resign this week, right as they started summer break. They have a now a numerical no- minority in the state house. So it, it is a little bit interesting that they're having a special election just about seven weeks before the general election. But Democrats need that 102 votes to be able to pass any bill. So um, it, it'll be a, a quiet next few weeks until special elections take place. Now, speaking of that special election on September 17th, have you heard of people interested in filling those positions? Yeah, there are a couple of ward leaders who uh, and um, a staffer for Representative Bullock who had been interested. Um, they had been rumored to be announcing the ward leaders in that district will decide who will run in that special election and then also replace her on the November ballot. It's a little bit different for Representative Kinsey because he had already announced that he wasn't running for re-election. There is already a Democratic nominee in that district. Andre Carroll is his name. He's a 33-year-old progressive and Germantown native. So he will likely be the candidate in the special election as well as he's already on the November ballot. Gotcha. All right. Well, we'll look forward to more developments with this story. More news after the break. Do you ever worry about how easy it is for strangers to get your personal information on the internet? Every day, data brokers collect and sell your personal information to third parties, from your social security number and address to your health and financial records. And this data can wind up in the hands of scammers, insurance companies, banks, and the government to target you. If you want to keep this from happening, check out Incogni. That's I-N-C-O-G-N-I. It takes just three minutes to set up, and it'll scrub your personal information from more than 180 data brokers and people search websites. There's also a 30-day money-back guarantee. Get Incogni to protect your data and your time. Use the code CityCast for 55% off the annual plan at Incogni.com. Again, that's I-N-C-O-G-N-I dot com. All right, shifting gears. Frank, this week you reported that there was a potential chemical contamination near Bartram's Garden along the Schuylkill River. And park officials closed a section of Bartram's Mile Trail. So can you explain a little bit what was actually found? Yeah, certainly. So a park uh, visitor or somebody using the trail had uh, reported back in April seeing a discharge from a, from a former industrial site there, mm-hmm. kind of a greenish yellow discharge. And it was flowing, I, I guess, across the trail and down uh, toward the river. We we're not sure if it actually went in the river. And the DEP, the State Department of Environmental Protection, went out twice, uh, checked it twice, uh, told the owner to put up a berm and kind of secure it. And they did. Uh, but apparently the same visitor was uh, passing by there uh, this week uh, and saw uh, the liquid again, discharging. The same person? Yes, the same person. So it's a, <laughs> it's a regular user. Uh, so that person notified uh, Bartram's Garden. Uh, Bartram's Garden got in touch with uh, Council Councilwoman's uh, Gauthier's office, and uh, they decided to close the site out of an abundance of caution. Uh, the council uh, woman's uh, office uh, said that there was chromium found mm-hmm. in the in the discharge, uh, multiple t- types of chromium: chromium three trivalent, chromium six hexavalent. And if you recall, uh, chromium was the chemical compound made famous in the Erin uh, Brockovich movie right, right. about uh, contamination of uh, drinking water. So uh, there was concern there. So they they closed the trail really kind of out of an abundance of caution. And uh, right now the DEP is uh, still assessing. Uh, I have not heard back from them what they actually found. Uh, the property owner said that, you know, they are working with the DEP. Uh, they're not sure if the contamination came from their site, but uh, they are assessing things right now. And it's possible that it was the storms, the heavy storms from uh, earlier this week that caused kind of water to flush out 
Um, and that area is surrounded by a bunch of old industrial properties. So it is also possible that the runoff came from another property crossed across this particular property owned by Alliance and uh, made its way on the trail. Has this runoff since been contained? I was told that it was contained and it was not a threat. Uh, the Philadelphia Water Department said it's not a threat. Uh, they, the water, drinking water in Philadelphia comes from the river, comes from an intake at the river, but this was downstream uh, from the intake, so it wouldn't affect it anyway. But uh, And it, they do not believe there were any kind of atmospheric discharges either. So it appears at this point to be relatively safe and uh, not a threat to human health. Frank, Bartram's Garden is in southwest Philly. How did neighbors react to this news? Um, Well, we do know that people that were out at the park yesterday uh, were were a bit shocked and a bit puzzled about what was going on. They saw the red caution tape, uh, the closed sign, uh, were not aware. Uh, When they learned of it, they were frightened, uh, you know, because a lot of people do use that Bartram's Mile Trail on a regular basis for hiking, uh, biking, walking, et cetera. And can people still access parts of Bartram's Garden now? Yes. Uh, the only entrance that was closed is kind of an unofficial entrance coming off uh, 51st Street and Botanic where it meets the trail. So the trail was just a small segment of it, maybe a few hundred feet was closed, and it's about a mile and a half trail. So parts of the trail are still open leading into um, Bartram's Garden. Great. All right. We're going to move to our last story. Now, we've got to talk about this really shocking TikTok controversy over at the Great Valley School District in Malvern, PA, which is about an hour outside of Philly. So to catch up, school leaders discovered earlier this year at the Great Valley Middle School that students created more than 20 fake TikTok accounts to impersonate teachers at the school in really demeaning and inappropriate ways. And that's according to your reporting, Maddie. Um, I also want to point out that some of the accounts were also racist, homophobic, and sexually inappropriate. This is a different time. I I mean, when I heard this news, I went right to my kids. Um, I have a middle schooler and a a soon-to-be fifth grader. I went right to them. You know, we had that phone usage conversation and, you know, behaviors online and what's okay, what's not okay, what could be dangerous, because this was just like really out there. Yeah, I I think that was absolutely people's reaction. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is uh, this is according to. The New York Times first reported on this earlier this month, and uh, apparently some of the students involved in making these accounts had posted a video last month in which they were uh, ostensibly apologizing, but were actually, you know, saying um, these teachers need to learn to take a joke. And uh, so there was a a lot of debate around uh, why kids didn't seem uh, more genuinely remorseful after they were called out for doing this and and after learning, you know, to what extent teachers were really hurt and uh, uh, in some cases traumatized uh, by this. And speaking of that New York Times article, the New York Times called it the first known group TikTok attack of its kind by middle schoolers on their teachers in the United States. And there was a school board meeting on Monday this week. You reported that 200 people showed up. Most of them were teachers. And, you know, there were a lot of questions raised as to how the district is going to handle this. Maddie, what happened at the meeting? The teachers union asked all of its teachers to come. And so there were probably a couple hundred teachers there um, from across the district, not just in the middle school. There were parents. Uh, people were both questioning the district as to its explanation for how it handled uh, handled this. The district has said that, you know, it's it's very sorry for what its teachers have gone through, but that it's it's largely limited in its ability to discipline kids for activity online that they say occurs outside of school. There were, you know, people who were questioning that explanation and saying they, you know, didn't think that this fell into uh, free speech. Mm -hmm. There were also, you know, 
questions about just how the district is going to handle things going forward. The teachers union has been calling for policy revisions. I'm not sure specifically what those are, but uh, there's there's also a lot of talk about, you know, what is the district going to teach kids going forward about digital citizenship, social media use. They said that they're going to be hosting a speaker series uh, starting this fall, I believe, um, that's going to be focused on that topic around social media use. But uh, a number of teachers were saying, you know, this this goes beyond social media too. This is also about empathy and right. and um, you know what are what are we teaching kids about that? Do we know what the district's policy was before all of this on how it handles bullying situations at all? I'm not entirely clear on that. I do know there was a parent who spoke, for instance, at this meeting who said, you know, separate from talking about what happened to the teachers, that her daughter had been bullied uh, on TikTok earlier this year by a student who created an account that was dedicated to telling her to kill herself. And she, this parent claimed that the response from the district was essentially, we can't do anything about this. And I, I think that the district is leaning on, uh, there was a Supreme Court decision a few years ago that found that a cheerleader in Schuylkill County, a high school cheerleader who had posted uh, some things like F school, F cheer um, after she was uh, didn't make the varsity team and was suspended by her school for that. The court ruled that she was wrongly suspended, that schools are, are limited and in, in what you know, how they can police what students post online outside of school. At the same time, it's a pretty gray area. And that's that's why there have been, you know, questions raised in this case about could the school district have uh, uh, done more in response? Well, we'll keep our eyes on any developments in this story. That was Maddie Hanna, education reporter. Also joining us was Jillian McGoldrick, state government reporter, and Frank Coomer, environmental reporter, And everyone's at the Philadelphia Choir. Thank you all so much for joining me on CityCast Philly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's time for the tip of the week, where we share a life hack for living in Philly. If you just recently moved to Philly or you're thinking about moving to a different neighborhood, check out our neighborhood guides. Our Hey Philly newsletter editor, Asha Prahar, takes us to the coffee shops, bookstores, and best places to soak up some sun or find some shade. You can check out the neighborhood guides at philly.citycast.fm. If you have a tip of the week, we'd love to hear from you too. Call or text us at 215-259-8170. That's all for today here on CityCast Philly. Our producers are Abby Fritz, Lizzie Goldsmith, and Noah Snyderman. Our Hey Philly newsletter editor is Asha Prihar. Adrian Gonzalez also contributed to the newsletter this week. And our host is me, Trine Nuri. Music is by Philly's own Interminable, with additional music from All the Kimonos and James Weldon. It's been a week, y'all, but if you enjoyed all of the episodes, please tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Philly. We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Bye. Bye.